our native land, our native land, our native, our native, our native land. Hoya, hoya, our native land. Hey everybody, Chad Leo here, host of Our Native Land, and welcome to another episode of the show. Before we get started, I would just like to do a territory acknowledgement. I acknowledge with respect the Lekwungen peoples on whose traditional territory Czech Studio stands upon, and to all the Indigenous tribes that are part of the Coast Salish New Channel and Kwakwakwak on Vancouver Island. I thank these na- uh, nations and traditional land keepers for allowing us to live work and play on the lands and I thank you the listener and viewer for tuning in to another episode of Our Native Land. Today's guest is John Langan and he is a Cree Salto uh, First Nation from the Kisakus First Nation in Saskatchewan. Uh, John is a full-time police officer, a part-time uh, Canadian soldier. He's a U of S graduate and continues to practice Indigenous ceremonies. He's a proud father and husband and a brand new author of his book A Spark in the Dark or Iskosis uh, Tipiskak. So John thank you so much for joining Joining us on our native land. Tonse on Ninjago at Lanate. So uh, I acknowledge also that I'm on Treaty 6 territory. I am from Treaty 4 territory, homeland of the Metis as well. Uh, so those three words I said there, so that's Tonse, that's the Cree language for hello. Mm-hmm. On Ninjago again is uh, Ojibwe, but uh, Soto is a dialect of Ojibwe. So I said hello, how are you? And then for Atlante, that's uh, any language as well saying hello how are you thank you so much for uh the land acknowledgement on your end uh, and the language lesson as well too uh so let's get right to it your book uh spark in the dark or is uh tipiskak uh well, why the title uh because uh, my first title that i had last year was a uh, resiliency my nose above water um And I noticed that that word was being overused a lot. So as I laid in my bed, because I was working with a professional editor from Arizona, and he said, "Uh, try rename your book there. It's just because he thought the same things as me. So I laid in my bed and I looked over at my son and it was his native name. eh? So his name is Iskoches, which is the little fire, but it also means like that little spark. Mm -hmm. Because even in the language, it has a, a lot behind it it's hard to kind of translate into English sometimes because mm-hmm. even when you use that word iskoches that's that uh when conception happens it's that little um it's like a little spark when when you're first born still inside inside of the belly mm-hmm. and I can go on and on about the language but uh yeah it's I'm so happy that I named it after my son um he'll know it in the future when he does read it i i got him to listen to a chapter of an audio book and he was just happy so <laughs> nice how how old's your son he's nine right now nice yeah. okay is that your only child no i have a daughter as well she's 11 right now yeah. nice awesome uh so uh, the message of your book i know it hasn't officially released yet we're kind of building up to that release date feel free to mention it you know uh, what what's the message of your book in general it's, so my target audience is in, in Indigenous youth, but as I kept on writing and writing, I was just like, no, this is for young adults as well. This is for all of Canada, for anybody who wants to kind of know, because as humans, we are naturally curious beings. So before I even did this book, I followed proper protocol. I made sure I went into ceremony and I asked permission to do this because all of our teachings are all oral. So I thought long and hard of what kind of message I wanted to do because me and my other ceremony friends were like, how are these young people going to know how to actually approach an old person? How are they going to know to actually put out that hand to reach out to people? So that was my a message that I wanted to give to young people is how to go to ceremony mm-hmm. and a common indigenous upbringing that is common all around us. Because mm-hmm. even people who kind of read the earlier copies are just like, wow, like they don't even know this kind of stuff happen Mm -hmm. but yet this is a story that that uh is a common story when i go to native communities like people are giving me hugs and telling me deep things that they wouldn't tell anybody else Mm -hmm. which i'm so happy that they told me but my main message that i want to say to young people is don't use your upbringing as an excuse use it as power because all those things that you talk of like all those things you experience as a young person they have a lot of value but it's all about how you use that upbringing and how you use those experiences and how to apply them in life in a good way 
That's really cool because I that message of not using those things is using those things as an excuse. I I often mention that uh, in my own personal life. So, you know, what what why do you think people use that excuse? Like, what well, why do you think why do you think that's so detrimental? It's just a default, like how we see things growing up as a child. Like me, um, I'll kind of go on to the things I experienced here. I would see how my parents would drink alcohol and my family would. And then it would go to pills and I would see how they dealt with their problems. Then it went to their harder stuff and I would see that. And I could have easily just been like, when I became an adult, it'd be like, okay, that's what's ingrained in my mind. So that's how I'll deal with that problem. But I was educated as a young person by my dad, who was also a residential school survivor. And my mom is a day school survivor. And my late brother is actually, he went to the last residential school in 1996 in Labrette. But my dad taught me, he's like, the creator gave you a mind to think you use it. Not everything you hear in the future is going to make sense. You do what makes sense to yourself in order to make it through this world in an honest way. So as I was young, I... I always thought to myself, okay, this is what I got to do for the future. Because my dad would tell me his experiences at residential school. But as a young person, you're, you think you know everything. So, <laughs> so, so I always took everything my parents said with a grain of salt. Eh? But as I matured and I learned more about these schools and all their experiences, I started to see that their trauma that they had, they were dealing with it. But my dad was smart in a way where he acknowledged that there's a big lack of generational gap of parents that don't know how to be parents, parents that don't know how to show love to their kids, how to kiss them on the lips, how to hug them, how to console them. So they see this, they see that how they're dealing with their traumas and things that they hide from everybody. Because there's so many things I learned, even in writing in this book with my own family, dark things that I didn't even want to put on paper. And I'm glad I didn't because it's it's very personal to my family, but some dark things that that I, I, I don't even know if I could deal with them, even though I seem like a real strong person and all that. But the previous generations and the trauma they went through, it's, it's, it's nuts, the stuff that they went through. Speaking of dark, things like you you do mention about uh you know at the beginning of the book uh sort of the start of your journey and part of it is is losing your your father to suicide and your your stepdad to to drugs from what i can understand so tell me a little bit about about that pain if you're okay to tell me oh yeah 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 no uh that's one thing about me i was raised to do everything with honesty and uh, that's what i always try to and even with the canadian forces leadership in my opinion is the most intimate thing that you can express to people because you're trying to convince people to follow you to for them to immediately say i'm gonna i would follow this guy to the end of the earth so with my father when he committed suicide i when i first wrote this book i thought he only tried once but no he tried multiple times multiple times and I, I had to um, I had to speak to my mom about it and just opening up all those old wounds with her. And then with my oldest brother, I had to open it up again, too. And it was hard, but I wanted to make sure that I got my family story first. But my father, yeah, he uh, he always wanted to. And he did a lot of dark things that I didn't even put in that book as well. Um, I'm so glad that I didn't get to know him and I healed from that too, just with the multiple fasts that I did so far and just, uh, losing him. I, it was right at the end of, or right at the beginning of my thoughts of remembering. Mm -hmm. So even as I reached out to his old lovers, cause in my mind, I was just like, maybe he was a bad lover, but he was a good person. So I started to reach out to his ex-lovers and stuff. And, and they said, John, you know what? It's good that you didn't get to know him. I was like, okay. He said, you turned out just fine without getting to know him. Wow. And then with my stepdad, um, him he, with his uh, residential school experiences, he hid everything from my family. But it was for a reason because my dad always said to concentrate on the present. It truly is a gift. And to concentrate on the future for what you can do to create a change. So all the things he went through, he always told me stories. Eh? And one I want to share is when uh, he went to residential school, because he went to the school. I don't know if you guys watched that movie yet. It's called it's called Indian Horse. I've heard of it. I haven't seen it. Uh, yeah. It's an awesome uh, movie, but it's my dad's residential school that he went to. And my dad told me a story when I was young about how he got a hockey stick 
when he was uh when he went home for the summertime and in that movie it it talks about the hockey program there and how awesome it is so my dad got a hockey stick and he brought it back and uh you had to do x amount of things before you can actually go and start playing hockey anyways my dad did he kept playing and uh yeah he got beat black and blue with a hockey stick when he was there because he wanted to play hockey but then he got beat black and blue with it and he said that's the last day that i ever let a man put a hand on me and then he left a residential school after that and he became a logger um but after that you know like you know i didn't really believe like i said i was young but then once i saw that movie you know i just i was tearing up in the theaters because i was like that's like what my dad said was actually true you know like and there was many more stories that he had eh? but the things lots 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 of pain in those schools and I'm so happy that my dad was smart enough to be like, hey, just to let you know, I'm dealing with a lot of stuff, but I'm going to try my best with you guys. You know, he, he always showed us love and he always was there for us whenever we needed him. And he went to ceremonies a lot. I just glorified this man. But then it came to the point to where he started getting into drugs. Um, yeah, he he did so much. He was such a hard worker and it, it transferred on to me. He transferred, he nurtured the heck out of me um because you always talk about nature versus nurture no he nurtured the heck out of me and he always told me a lot of things like you cannot be on welfare you you cannot call yourself a man if you're on welfare you got to have a job you got to have a car and you got to have your own place that's when you can at least call your foundation of being a man mm -hmm. but no um yeah it, it it went from alcohol to pills and then he started taking the uh, hydromorph into his veins intravenously and mm -hmm. Then he ended up getting chronic obstructive pulmonary disorder. And uh, no, he's, he just kind of slowly deteriorated from there. And yeah, I lost him in 2014. But no, yeah, it's, it kind of sucks uh, losing a father and then a dad. And yeah, it's, it's a lot. But uh, just with my ceremonies and all that, and I know I'm kind of speaking past, hopefully, which is which my book tries to explain but uh yeah i i can go into ceremony and i can check how he's doing i can ask the spirits how he's doing and i can check on him and it's a good feeling so yeah we're still talking per se yeah, yeah but absolutely. that's that's really yeah. it's very really nice yeah. i appreciate appreciate you yeah. sharing that so you said he he built a good foundation and i think that ties into maybe uh, part of the reasons why, you know, you joined the military, uh, you know, and then afterwards you became a cop. So let's talk a little bit about that journey of becoming, uh, you know, a part of the military and, uh, you know, a part of cop and maybe some of uh, the struggles that came along from doing that. You did mention uh, a little bit, maybe there was uh, some, you know, racism involved during that process. Oh, I, I, I always experienced racism. And then even to this day, even with my job, um, I'll, I'll go to Walmart, whatever. And me, I like kind of like putting on a hat like this or whatever. Eh? And mm -hmm. um, and I know who the floor walkers are in Walmart and stuff. Eh? And since I work with them and uh, like, and I investigate files with them, but I'll still be followed around. And then I'll look behind me and I'll be like, hey, but I don't want to see his name. And you don't have to follow me, man. And then, <laughs> but just no matter what, like no matter what I do, like even... At the end of the day, I'm still Mr. Lang, and I'm, even though I have army and I have police, at the end of the day, when I pull off my badge uniform, I'm still, I'm still an indigenous person with brown skin. But, but uh, yeah, it all started when I was young. Like I used to have long hair. Um, uh, uh, my mom always grew it out, and I, I had it going down to the small of my back, and. Kids would always call me a girl once in a while, but I didn't really mind that. It was mainly the adults. Um, I was getting so used to it, uh, just kind of always being teased. But then there was one school in particular when I went to Oxbow, Saskatchewan, where my mom made my hair nice. She had nice little leather ties on it. Yeah. And I went into school there and um, the photographer, I don't know if he was having a bad day, but he said, boys aren't supposed to have hair like that. And then uh, he said, tuck your braids behind your collar there. And I was just, and me being so young, I was just like, okay, because I, I was just not also what they say. So yeah. I put braids in the back of my, in the back of my collar. And I use it, like, I have nice teeth, but they're all just kind of like, you know, I was just trying to yeah. make him happy at the same time. Because at the back of my mind, there was a lot of other instances where my parents would just get pissed off at people all the time. It was mainly adults. Yeah. So I went back home, told them, 
and they got pissed off. They got mad at the principal and all that. But no other photos were taken because we didn't stay there too long. Mm-hmm. And then even when I found $20 on the ground, I found it in some gravel. It was all dusty. And uh, in my mind, when I was young, I was like, hey, I'm going to go to the arcade. So I went to go play Street Fighter 2. went to go play Big Doug. That was <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So I put the $20 down on the counter and, and my hair was in braids. Eh? And there's this big belly guy, big sweat stains all over him. And, and he was like, where'd you get that from? Did you steal it? And then I kind of explained to him, I just found it outside. It was underneath some gravel. And he's like, we don't serve your kind here. And then I was just trying to absorb what he said. Eh? Yeah. Cause my dad was teaching me some things. Eh? So I just kind of grabbed that $20 and ran away from there. And, and once again, my parents got mad. So then my so then my dad came back there and he grabbed the man. He grabbed that guy right over the counter. He's like, come yeah. here, my boy. And he said, if I was to cut you and if I was to cut myself, what color would our blood be? And that guy said, red, because you're scared, eh? Yeah. And then my dad just blah, 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 let him go. He's like, yeah. don't ever talk to my son like that again. Yeah. And, and just seeing that over and over, you know, I, that's when I just I said, no, I want to cut my hair. So, so then I spoke to my mom and you know then i spoke to my dad and i kind of go into the book how i was feeling because my editor was just like you need to put people in your shoes how you felt it eh? so mm-hmm. i kind of paint a picture of exactly what i was going through yeah no i feel yeah. it yeah and then my dad took me to a barber and then we cut my hair and my mom still has my hair i think uh she uh, she told me she still has it but now as i kept going with my life because at this point i'm like okay i need to be like everybody else because you know, that's, that's just how it was trying to fit in with everybody. Eh? So then uh, things still happen no matter where I went, but uh, I kind of want to fast forward to when I joined Air Cadets, which is a thing that really changed my life. Um, I almost got into like a dark life, exactly what I was talking about, where you could easily just start doing drugs, you can start doing this, you can, you know, I was about to get into that life. And then I just started to talk to people about Air Cadets and I got in trouble for a break and enter. Um, um, I was with three other friends of mine, our friends, I say, mm-hmm. uh, classmates. So uh, we ended up uh, going to go borrow some video games because that's what he said. We're going to go borrow some video games, John, because I always used to go eat lunch at his house. So I was like, okay, yeah, yeah, because his mom always loved having us. Um, so then we kind of went off the beaten path a bit. We went down the alley. Then once I saw two people jump over the fence, I'm like, oh, maybe it's locked. And, you know, it's kind of hard to get a, to go all the way around. Mm-hmm. But then they came back over and they had an arm pose of video games and all this other random stuff. And we all started running. And in the back of my mind, I was like, okay, this is bad. So then we went to his house and he kind of put everything on there. And they're like, John, do you want any of this? I was like, no, I don't want any of that. Yeah. Anyways, I went back to school. They stayed there. And then uh, then it was always in the back of my mind. And then the cops, they showed up at my door. RCMP showed up at my door and my dad was behind me. I was embarrassed. They told me what was going on and I was charged for break and enter. I did a warrant statement now that I think about it with my police experience. Yeah. And, um, yeah. He, he said, out of all the stories, John, he's like, I only believe you. Just to let you know your three friends try to pin it on you. And then me, I was like, man, my brown skin. Uh, you know, so. <laughs> yeah. Just felt so, like, well, I'm getting singled out here. Yeah. So then I still ended up going to court. But then I got put into the alternative measures program. But that was the first month that it actually got put into effect. So um, so I got to work with the victim's family. And then I would always, like, I would stook. So that's kind of putting wheat bundles together and tying them off. It's like the old school way. They, they kind of just do it as a tradition. Or, mm-hmm. Then I would uh, pick concrete slabs just as much as I could do. Just But I would uh, get to know the victim's family. And, uh, and then I found out their family was involved with their cadets. And I would listen eh, as I was sweating all over the place. And mm-hmm. I would hear about it. Then because I knew they wanted to get to know me. So they, they gave me the secret, I guess, uh, staying on a trouble aid or like stay occupied. I was like, okay. Yeah. So then I started asking about air cadets. Then I went there by myself because my parents were kind of doing their drugs and doing their own thing. Mm-hmm. And I, I signed up and uh, they're like, Oh, you need your parents uh, permission. So they gave me a little slip and I was like, man, it's going to take forever to get my parents because they're never around. Yeah. So then I just went home and I tied it on my, okay, how long would it take me to walk home? So then I went home and I forged my dad's uh, <laughs> signature and then yeah. I came back and then I joined and it's the best decision I made in my life. Yeah. Uh, from there, that's when I, uh, I started to get more structure, order and discipline and getting yelled at and stuff. Uh, but no, and then I stayed with that. And then one of my history teachers, he, uh, he was in the militia before. 
Uh, so me and him would always talk about it. And then he would always ask her in class, like, who's going to join the army here? Me, I'd, I'd always put my hand up, eh? Mm-hmm. And he right on. And then, uh, so then I, so I did air cadets and then I went straight into the army from there. But from there, I always, it's ingrained into my brain to always cut my hair. Eh? Even though both my jobs would allow it, they would yeah. 120% allow it. Yeah. I was going to ask that if you had it right now, would it be okay? Yeah, yeah, it, it, it would. And my son has his long hair too. And he, and he constantly asks me, Dad, when are you going to grow it out? But as I wrote this book, I'm just like, I still have to overcome that. Like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's, it's, a, it's a real touchy thing. Yeah. But one day I will grow it out. And when I do grow it out, I'm not going to cut it. Yeah. It's yeah. just I got to make that decision because I spoke to my wife about it. And she's like, make sure you do it for you, John. Don't do it just because you're doing this book. Don't do it just because that's how you wanted people to preserve you. Do it because you want to do it. I'm like, mm-hmm. yeah, that's true. So I'm going to do it when I'm ready just because it's so ingrained in my head with the army and the military. And yeah, police. I know. And I mean, like, yeah. I mean, there, there, there is you know, not to diminish it, but I mean, there is a level of practicality of having short hair in the middle of the summer and having to put all your cop gear on and your, you yeah. know, your cop hat. Like, I mean, there's just a practical thing to it. So I, I understand. Yeah. 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 But, oh yeah, that's, uh, yeah, I don't want to give away too much in a book there, yeah. but there, <laughs> there's a lot, there's a lot in there. Like yeah. there's a lot. Yeah, so speak, so speaking about the book, cause we're almost out of time. So, um, you know, give us, give us, uh, first of all, what, uh, what do you hope people take away from it? Like if I'm going to pick up the book and read it, uh, you know, what, where am I going to be? How, where's my headspace going to be when I'm done? Uh, that's one thing that I'm doing right now, since I'm getting a bunch of pre-orders now, <laughs> like, uh, I'm trying to manage my store, but yeah. uh, the way I'm wording it is, you know, just to create that foundation of understanding. Because that's one thing that I was taught is communication is, is the most important thing in the world. It doesn't matter if it's a relationship and talking to your wife. It doesn't matter if you're talking to your kids. It doesn't matter if you're talking to coworkers. Things get lost in miscommunication. So I want that foundation of understanding between all Canadians. And maybe it'll grow from there and it'll be all of the world. Um, that's, that's what I mainly want to communicate is a proper understanding because throughout our history of Indigenous people, we always had a lack of understanding. There's always that kind of fog that's kind of in between there that we need to understand each other. In the words of my cookum, and this is for my cookum who's like really strict, she, she said, we learned so much about white people culture, it's time they started learning about ours. Mm-hmm. After she told that to me, I was just like, yes, yes, yes. So that's the main thing that I want to communicate. Yeah. Thank you. And if people want to get your book, uh, you got a website where they can pre-order? Yeah. So right now, pre-orders are happening at www.asparkinthedark.com. And then uh, it's going to be available. It's going to be audio book. It's going to be ebook. It's, it's going to be everything. And it's going to be as much places as I can. I'm putting them on reservation gas stations, bookstores, I'm putting them on Amazon. It's going to be everywhere. That's so. awesome. And you know what the great thing is that the, the, the thing that captures me the most is that front page uh, of, of you. Like, here, I'm going to flip it here just so people can see it like that. Just the, the triple effect of that is so amazing. Where did the idea come from? That was what I had in my mind when I first started on Halloween last year. Eh? Oh, yeah. When I put my mind to things, like I told my wife, I'm like, I'm going to write a book. And then she looked over at me and she was like, I know you're going to do it because <laughs> everything you say you're going to do. Yeah. Uh, so that's what I had in my mind. And then I communicated with the photographer and I was just like, this is what I want. Mm-hmm. Everything I'd done with the book, even though it is self-published because I had a couple of publishers reach out to me, but it's just too culturally sensitive. Yeah. Yeah. Um, everything is done professional, the photography, the editing, the cover design, the Everything that I've done about it is all professional. So that's because I want a professional product. So. Yeah, no, and it, it looks fantastic. I know we're running out of time, but I just one more question just came up. Like, because I, I didn't really get a chance to really dive into your cop side of your life. Like, you know, you talked a bit about, you know, even just doing patrols in Walmart and, and running into some issues. But, like, do you feel because you're an indigenous cop, like, have you experienced any kind of, how do I put this, like, you know, when they assign cops to like indigenous reserves as sort of like liaisons, like, do you find like, just cause you're indigenous they're like, okay, you know, John, you know, like you're meant to go do that. Like, do you find that, uh, do you find 
do you find that like um, a respectful assignment or do you find it like, you know, you don't put me there just because I'm indigenous, uh, put me there because I'm qualified. You know what? I, do you get what yeah. I'm getting at, John? Yeah. I, I hear this question all the time mm -hmm. and um, I'll, I'll kind of just begin. It's just to tokenization, right? That's what yeah, I'm yeah. getting at really. Yeah. yeah. 95% of indigenous people that I deal with are just like, it's awesome. Like they just love it. And then there's a 5% who are usually hired drunk and they're just like, you know, they'll, they'll, they'll say things like you dark skin. In <laughs> yeah. but, but the majority of people that I deal with are awesome. And there's times that I do go to calls, but they don't ever do that to me. I recognize that I could be a poster boy and I probably am, but I find myself in a position to create as much change as I can. My grand scheme of thoughts of what I want to do, because I have a grander scheme of things, I always have plans in my head, mm -hmm. is I want to make an indigenous police force. Mm -hmm. We have to be policing our own people. Mm -hmm. That's what I would want to see. I would feel instantly comfortable once I see an indigenous police officer come through my doors or anything. Mm -hmm. And once a person hears my voice, which I'm finally heard my accent after I did my audio book, <laughs> once I start talking, people are instantly more comfortable. Yeah. Instantly more comfortable. Yeah. That's awesome. Thank you for sharing that. John, I feel like I got 10 more questions for you, but we're out of time, but maybe we'll catch up with you after the book's release and see how life's going for you, John. So I want to thank you again for coming on the show on our native land and best of luck with your book. And I'm going to uh, log in and get my pre-order too. So thank you so much, John. You're very welcome. I'll see you later. That's right. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you. <laughs>